مشتاق ہے میں ایچ آر مینیجر ہوں اسلام آباد کلب کا اور آج کی اس باقاعدہ ایونٹ کا ہم آغاز کرتے ہیں تھوڑی سی بیک گراؤنڈ میں بتانا چاہوں گا آج کے اس پروگرام کے حوالے سے کہ اپریل دو ہزار نو میں ہم نے ڈیسائیڈ کیا کہ اسلام آباد کلب کی جو لائبریری ہے اس کا ایک خاص حصہ ہم پاک یو ایس ریلیشن شپ کی پرموشن کے لیے اور اس کے انڈرسٹینڈنگ کے لیے ہم ڈیڈیکیٹ کرتے ہیں تو اس کے لیے ہم نے ایک جو اگر آپ کا لائبریری میں وزٹ ہو تو ایک مخصوص حصہ ہم نے اس کو ریزرو کر کے اس کو مارٹن لوتھر کنگ ریڈنگ روم کا نام دیا اور اس میں جتنی کتابیں آپ دیکھیں گے یہ یو ایس ایمبیسی کی کوآپریشن سے ان, ان کی طرف سے آئی ہیں اور اس کے علاوہ آڈیو ویڈیو اکوپمنٹ بھی انہوں نے ہمیں ڈونیٹ کیا اور یہ سلسلہ اب تک جاری ہے اور کنٹینیو ان رہے گا آج کا جو پروگرام ہے یہ بیسکلی مس کیرن اینڈرسن جو پبلک افیئرس سیکشن یو ایس ایمبیسی کی ہیں ان کی کوششوں سے ہوا کہ انہوں نے ہمیں گائیڈ کیا ایجوکیشنل فاؤنڈیشن آف پاکستان یو ایس اے کی کہ ہم ممبرز اور ان کے بچے یا جو وہ ان کے گیسٹ جو امریکہ میں فردر اسٹڈی کنٹینیو کرنا چاہتے ہیں اور فل برائٹ اسکالرشپ کو اویل کرنا چاہتے ہیں اس کے طریقے کار پہ بریفنگ دے دی جائے کیونکہ اکثر لوگوں کا ہم نے یہ دیکھا ہے کہ ان کو یہ پتہ نہیں ہے کہ اس کے لیے اپلائی کیسے کرنا ہے <coughs> تو اس سلسلے میں محترمہ شازیہ خان اور <coughs> رافیہ سوی تشریف لائیں ہمارے پچھلے دنوں اور ان کے ساتھ مل کے ہم نے یہ ڈیسائڈ کیا کہ یہ آج کا پروگرام ہم آرگنائز کرتے ہیں یہ اس سلسلے کا آج کا پہلا پروگرام ہوگا اور آگے چل کے فردر ہم نے یہ بھی ڈیسائڈ کیا ہے کہ ہم پرسنل انٹرویوز کی شکل میں وہ کینڈیڈیٹ جو اپلائی کرنا چاہتے ہیں فل برائٹ اسکالرشپ کے لیے ان کے لیے اسلام آباد کلب کے اندر ہم انٹرویوز ارینج کر دیں گے تاکہ فردر ان کو ون ٹو ون سیشن کے اندر بھی جو گائیڈنس پرووائڈ چاہیے اس حوالے سے سوری تاکہ اس حوالے سے ان کو جو گائیڈنس چاہیے وہ ون ٹو ون میٹنگ میں بھی ہم فلی ان کو پرووائڈ کر سکیں تو آج کے پروگرام کا فارمیٹ یہ ہے کہ مخصوص شاہین صاحب میں یو ایس ایمبیسی سے ان کی پندرہ منٹ کی پریزنٹیشن ہے ای لائبریری سسٹم کے اوپر اور اس کے بعد مس شازیاں اور مس رافیہ یہ پریزنٹیشن دیں گی فل برائٹ اسکالرشپ اور اس سے ریلیٹڈ جو بھی ایکٹیویٹیز ان کی ہیں اور اس کے بعد کویشچن آنسر سیشنز ہوگا اور اینڈ پہ پھر آپ کی ریفریشمنٹ کے لیے چائے کوکیز وغیرہ بھی اویلیبل ہیں تو وداؤٹ اینی فردر ڈیلے میں ریکویسٹ کروں گا مخصوص شاہین صاحب سے کہ تشریف لائیں اور پریزنٹیشن سے آغاز کریں Thank you so much, Dr. Sir. Uh, before my colleagues from the United States Educational Foundation in Pakistan start their presentation, I will just introduce you to the eLibrary USA. Basically, this is a digital library that contains more than 30 online databases and thousands of newspapers, journals, periodicals, books, uh, freely accessible to you. It has login password, but uh, to the members of the Islamabad Club, we will offer you free access to these databases. I have brought a membership form. You will just fill it and return to me and give your email in it. Uh, when I go back into, uh, in, my, in my office, I will make your account. You will get your ID and password in your emails. So please give your email definitely. So uh, as I told you, these are all the databases that Americans use there in public libraries. Today's presentation is uh, on Education USA, how, to, how you will pursue your studies in the United States. So I will focus my presentation on the resources that are available in ELAB e USA on studying in the United States. So before going into detail, if you go to resources, I'm already logged in with my email, um, with my password into this library. If you go to e resources, you will get a list of all the databases that are available in, into it. So, if you need to find a publication, you don't want to search any keyword, but you want to find a certain publication, you will click to A to Z guide to ELIB USA journals. And if you, for example, if you click uh, uh, US News and World Report, you can get it because US, e, uh, US uh, uh, News and World Report gives the uh, ranking of the university's top 10 rankings every year, I think arrived by uh, every after every six months like that so you can if you want to know what are the top universities in the united states you can log in here and search the journals uh, like u.s news and world but then these are all other databases like academic one file it has more than 
7,000 journals, scholarly journals on social sciences, natural sciences, like that. Then uh, I will just show you two websites. College Navigator, it, this, when you click it, it leaves you how you can find, uh, what are the disciplines you want to study in the United States, what are the colleges uh, that you like or you want to study in which state, which are the institutions you, jo you want to join in. So you just click on it. For example, if I click it and it takes me directly to the website. So you need not to log in to, with your password. Once you, you are logged in into it, you need not to give any password. Uh, meanwhile, this website loads. Uh, this database contains a full text digital library that contains more than 20,000 digitized books in, to, in it. Like uh, this, this is called eBrary. If you go to the list, it's, it has been arranged alphabetically. You go to eBrary and just here is the search screen. I search GRE and I found about uh, 656 titles on GRE. So you need not to buy any GRE books or TOEFL books or any uh, like SIAT. There are many tests that you require to get uh, admission into the uh, colleges in the US. So you just need to go there, read these, or uh, prepare the tests from this. Here. So other than that, uh, it has resources like uh, encyclopedias. There are more than 200 encyclopedias in this li digital library. There are more than 1,000 uh, documentaries, films in filmmakerslibrary.com. Then there is a database designed for natural sciences, Gale Science in Context, databases on environment, Growlier online. So there are thousands of resources uh, if you want to find uh, in the CD e-library e USA. So membership is free. You just need to sign up this form. I'm just providing. If you want to have access to this digital library, just fill, fill up this form and return to me after the program. Uh, with this, I will finish my presentation and have a look. Okay. So, first of all, uh, I want to thank Shaheen for that introduction. This is actually a really valuable resource and all of you should look into this because um, you have, whether you're preparing for the GRE or the SAT or the TOEFL or you're just looking for books and resources, it really is phenomenal how all of this information is now available just at the click of a button. So please do sign up, avail this opportunity. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit later about GRE prep resources and I think this is an important one. Um, and this was the, the website that Shaheen was opening, by the way, so it, it comes straight to, a college na uh, straight to a college navigator. Rafi and I will also be walking through a, a separate search engine that we use, so there's a lot of information on there online. Um, so very quickly, we do have a presentation here with us today, but I want to keep the session mostly interactive because I know a lot of you will have your individual questions and concerns and I want to try and address as many of those as possible. So my name is Shazia Khan. I'm the country manager for Fulbright Outreach and Educational Advising through the Fulbright Commission here in Pakistan. We're also known as the United States Educational Foundation in Pakistan. And Rafia, if you want to quickly introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. My name is Rafia Sufi and I'm an education advisor with USCFP. Looking forward to working with you guys. Any questions you guys have, make sure if you don't want to ask in front of everybody, just pull me to the side at the end of the session and feel free to ask. 
So when I say country manager, there's actually three full service offices for advising in Pakistan. There's one located in Islamabad, it's an F-62. How many of you have seen the USCFP office or visited? Okay, so a few of you. For the rest of you, it's also where the Prometric Test Center is located. So if you register to take the GRE exam, you'll be coming to our office. Um, it's also where the Fulbright program is administered. So if you receive the Fulbright, you're interacting with your program officers. It's all based out of the same location. In Lahore, our office is located in the Foreman Christian College in FCC. It's on the campus on the backside. And in Karachi, our office is close to the Dotalwar. So they're all pretty central locations. And we have about a team of 14 educational advisors across these three offices. So no matter where you are, there's someone available to help you out. The unique thing about Pakistan and our advising services in Pakistan is that all of us, whoever is working with the advising department, does have a U.S. degree. So they're speaking from first-hand experience. They've been through the process themselves, not necessarily through the Fulbright, but they have studied in the United States. So I myself went to school in Philadelphia. I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Rafia went to Ohio Wesleyan. So we can also uh, tackle a lot of questions you may have just about you know, being in the US, work opportunities in the US. What is it like being an international student in the US? Um, OK. So very quickly, I'm just going to put this slide up here and let you know that uh, our organization has three service departments. So has everyone here heard of the Fulbright? Okay, who hasn't heard of the Fulbright? Okay, so that's good. All of you know about the Fulbright. Um, if you have any questions related to it, we'll definitely spend enough time on that today as well. But I also wanted to let you know about Education USA. So the advising services that I was talking about, our offices in three cities, our 14 advisors, they all come under the Education USA umbrella. And there's about 400 centers across the globe. So we have a lot of resources we count on. If you feel like you're also traveling to other countries, we can probably get you in touch with a relevant contact in another location as well. Um, our role is to basically promote and support US higher ed. So what, even though what the programs department does is very specific, it's related to scholarship administration, the Fulbright scholarship, or other UGrad exchange programs, the advising department covers a lot of ground. It covers everything under the sun when it comes to students that are interested in the US. So maybe you have questions about culture, maybe you have questions about transfer of admission, about visa, about you know what to take, what to pack, what to eat in the US, everything. Um, and that's, that's a part of our job responsibility. So like I said, I want to keep the session interactive. And as we go, go on, I do want you to kind of chime in with your questions. Which brings me to my first interactive slide. So why should you care? Why does it matter? <laughs> does anyone want to volunteer an answer? USAFP at USA sounds great. Who cares? <laughs> why do you think it's relevant? Anyone? Will you accept the political and non-political answers both? Sure, why not? <laughs> we'll make it interesting. <laughs> Politically, yes. Sure, it is important. There's good business. Well, you see, the, at, at present, the economic scenario around the world it is not uh, uh, that uh, progressive. And uh, most of the countries uh, in the Europe, they have switched over this, uh, towards this education <coughs> and tourism. And uh, some of them uh, have made uh, good business out of education, the way the UK is going, and the way the Euro European, <coughs> the Euro countries are going. I think one of the reasons uh, America is uh, not facing a very good economy, America is in a lot of controversies with the world, and uh, I being the Pakistani and, uh, and, and a long alloy of America sitting in Pakistan, uh, seeing many budgets spent by America in Pakistan, it is the high time that America should take care of the world economic and world education. Thank okay, you. good, good response. Uh, definitely, sure, anytime there's countries working with other countries, there's economic reasons, there's political reasons, there's business reasons. But which brings me to an interesting fact about USCFP. How long do you think it's been around in Pakistan? the Fulbright Commission, or the Fulbright Scholarship, or the United States Educational Foundation. Since when has it been in Pakistan? When was it established? And this is the fun thing, because I also have prizes. What's that? 
Well, can someone raise their hand so I know who to give a prize to? About 15 years. 15 years? Yeah. Around 1950? 1950, yeah. Can we get that gentleman a mug? <laughs> It's actually, our, our organization has been in Pakistan since 1951, which comes as a surprise to a lot of people, but we've been sending Fulbrighters and we have been hosting US scholars for a really long time. So, um, and, and one of the reasons, of course, is that educational cultural exchange, it has a lot of positive effects. So Pakistan right now is the biggest Fulbright country in the world. We're sending about 250 Fulbright scholars to the US every year. No other country has such a big program. But beyond that, how many students in total do you think are in the US right now? How many Pakistani students in total do you think are in the US right now? Anyone? Around the 52 states. Across the US, yes. Because there are few states who are giving us education, others that uh, have uh, known in, in other fields. It's my, in my opinion, it's around 500 times. No, Pakistani, Five students. Pakistani students. Pakistani students in the Pakistani US. Pakistani students? Yeah. 2000? Huh? 2000? 2000. 15,000. 15, okay, it's in between the two numbers. <laughs> I wish, no. <laughs> it's not 10,000. Okay, wait. Seven, eight, and um, what else? <laughs> 6,000. Let's hear some more. Five, okay. Who said 4,500? Okay. It's about 4,600 Pakistanis currently in the US, and that includes Fulbrighters. But I wanted to kind of draw your attention to this fact because. Uh, when you think of Fulbright and you think of it, it, of it being the biggest scholarship in the whole world and we're sending about 250 people, there's a lot beyond the Fulbright as well. So it's not your only option. Suppose you apply for the Fulbright, you don't get it. There's a lot of opportunities to apply independently to the US. So out of those 4,600 students currently, 4,600 Pakistani students currently in the US, and that's all international applicants from Pakistan going to the US, only about 250 of them are Fulbrighters, and a lot of them are independent applicants. So lots and lots and lots of opportunities. But again, it brings me back to why should you care? You're all here today for a reason. And I want to try and get a sense of, you know, why? What you're, what you're hoping to get out of the session, what you'd like to learn, what information you'd like us to provide, so that Rafia and I can make sure that we address all of those concerns. So let's get a few, you know, what, why, why are you here today? What would you like to learn? Just start yelling them out. <laughs> yes? Okay. Uh are there any special considerations for uh, people with some sort of disabilities, like hearing impairment or physical disabilities? Yes. The great thing about the US, so it's counterintuitive. The answer is no. But that's what is so great about the US because as applicants, they are impartial. If a student is applying with a disability, uh, they will you know, consider it the same as any other applicant because every school in the US that is accredited, that is recognized, is required to provide special assistance for any disability under the sun. So it's a part of the legal framework there. So out of those institutions in the US, we didn't cover the total number there. There's about 3,900 of them. All of them that are accredited will offer assistance, have a legal structure in place, and have special facilities in place uh, to accommodate any disability. So yes. Okay. Second question is, uh, GRE normally entails mathematics. Yes. Uh, people applying who are artists and people who are the graduates of the National College of Arts, there are not that many mathematics. Yep. So what do you do with the GRE? No, that's a very good question. The GRE is unfortunately, it's just an admissions requirement. It's like an entrance exam. However, based on the field you're applying for, whether you're applying through Fulbright, you're applying independently, the admissions committee and the panel will take into consideration what you're applying for. So if you're a fine arts student, you've always studied fine arts, um, maybe they'll look at, you know, that you have reasonable proficiency with math and with verbal. Just because on a US campus environment, even if you're a fine arts student, you may be taking AutoCAD or design softwares, things like that. So they'll look for a reasonable amount of proficiency, but they definitely would not be as critical if you have a low math score uh, as compared to a student who is applying for engineering or computer science. 
Okay, so we'll hope to come. But any other general uh, questions that you hope to, information you hope to get out of this is session age, today? Is age a limit? No. And I've been to a US college where, and I think Rafia can share her experience. I've sat in a classroom with a 90 year old lady and someone who was oh, super smart, years. super smart uh, young student who was like four or five years younger than me as a freshman. So they don't discriminate against age either. So for all the parents that are here for their children, you should keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. Your web is not that helpful uh, uh, now regarding this. Okay. Do we not think this is helpful? Is this helpful? Yes. Okay, good. So majority rules here. So um, reason, yes. Sure. Yes. Certain types of English speaking exam, yes. such as mathematical analysis or just logical analysis, and how do you relate these exams for, for earning for a very full rights scholarship, very full rights scholarship to the to different academia? You see, how do you relate it? You see, I, I go for engineering, others go for law, mm -hmm. others go for management sciences. Sure. How do you relate this full right? You see, all the score with different academia. And how it is, how it becomes acceptable? Well, let me, I think because there's a lot of questions about Fulbright, let me just take a minute, and I don't know if we had a special slide for the Fulbright here. So let me just take a minute to talk a little bit holistically about the Fulbright, and let's hand out these brochures here. You see, so when I entered here, I thought it was a quiz program. A quiz program? It is a quiz for casting and giving prizes and something. You see, uh, I, I, I came over here just to have some information. What information would you like? Okay, great. So that's what I'm about to give. Okay. The reason why we're keeping this interactive today, and I think that's also one of the main distinction, distinctions between how seminars or classrooms or workshops are often conducted in the U.S. and in Pakistan. So what I've seen here very often is you go into a lecture, you go into a seminar, you have a professor doing all the talking and the students are doing all the listening, whether or not it's relevant or not. So what we try to do as a matter of policy through our organization is adopt the U.S. policy, keep it discussion-based, keep it open-ended, try and figure out what exactly you're looking for so that when you leave and go home today, you've left with some valuable information. So talking about the Fulbright, um, since I think the time of year is relevant, a lot of you are probably curious about it. The deadline for the Fulbright is May 15th. It's coming up. It's right around the corner. So the Fulbright is a fully funded scholarship for master's or PhD level education in the United States. The brochure that you're getting that is being passed around the room right now covers a lot of basic information about the Fulbright. Furthermore, the application is available online. You can download it. We do not have an electronic submission as yet, but you can complete the application download it, fill it out, all of your questions. It's pretty self-explanatory. There's also a page of instructions that comes with the scholarship application. Um, the basic requirements of the Fulbright are that if you are applying for a master's level scholarship, you need to have completed 16 years of schooling by December of the year that you are applying in. Okay? Which means that if you're applying this May for a master's level Fulbright, you need to have your 16 years of schooling completed by this December 2013. If you're, if you're applying for a PhD level scholarship, you need to have 18 years of formal schooling completed by December 2013. The scholarship, if you apply in May, will be for placement in the fall of 2014. And yes. Have your GRE done uh, I mean before the date of application? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ideally, you will have your GRE score submitted. Yeah, but you can even, if the deadline is the 15th of May, you can have. <laughs> Can't be after the 15th. And we would recommend we act that you actually try and take it sooner. If you can manage to take the test in April, because every year we have some students that end up messing up their GRE performance or for whatever reason they don't do as well as they had hoped and then they're out of time. So if you take it in April and if for whatever reason you're not happy with your score, you have time to register again, take the test again. Um, yes? What is the minimum score for getting, uh, for getting uh, scholarship for Bright on GRE? 
Good question. The minimum score is about 137 in each section. However, if you're writing down, I want you to scratch that because that does not by any means imply that if you get a 137 in each section that you're going to be able to make it for the Fulbright. Because keep in mind the Fulbright is a competitive scholarship and you get about 100 points just by answering your name on the test. What advice would you give to a person like me, the old man, and the number of things, and experience in law, experiment in science, and being a deadly faculty number 50, and if he wants to go to any U.S. university, mm -hmm. uh, for higher studies, say for PhD, and, and uh, are, are these different level concentrated? Sure. The same? Definitely. Well, first of all, there is no age requirement. So even if you wanted to apply for the Fulbright and you thought that you wanted to study a PhD, um, you are more than welcome to do that. But in addition to that, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the Fulbright is not the only scholarship and exchange program administered by USCFP. So for people that are further along in their careers, they might want to consider the Hubert Humphrey Fellowship Program, which is for mid-career professionals. You basically, uh, it's an opportunity to go in the US, study something related to your field or your field of interest. So maybe it's law, if you have some professional experience in law or public service. So these are all, there's about 14 programs that we administer. Some of them are for undergraduate students. Some of them are for graduate students. Uh, some of them are for teachers, like the FLTA program, uh, the NISA program, Near East South Asia Undergraduate Program, and the UGRAD program are basically semester or one year exchange programs. So that's for students that are currently enrolled in a bachelor's that would like to go to the U.S. for a semester or year. I think you have a question. Sorry, for those of you who want more information on all these programs, we have handouts here, so just if you're interested, come and collect them after the presentation. Yeah, go on. You had a question. Criteria for a sports scholarship. What level would you be applying for? Sorry for another interruption. I'm sorry, I have a question right now. I think I should take... He's already started his question. It's only fair. Will you give some brochure or some literature on other scholarships you were mentioning? Yes, I said if you are interested in learning more about our program, there's a brochure yes. here at the end of the presentation. Yes, yes. Um, for sports scholarships, you said you're applying as an undergraduate or you're applying as a master's? Okay, if you're applying as an undergraduate, there are sports scholarships available in the U.S. However, they want to see that you have competed at the national level in Pakistan. So not just a club or recreational activity, but you have performed at the city level or intercity, interschool. Um, you should schedule an appointment, come and sit with us. We'll identify different programs for you. Um, and I'll kind of run through how we go about doing that, but I'll share our information at the end. This would be a more detailed conversation, and you should come and sit with one of the advisors. But very quickly, for a lot of you asking about the different scholarship programs, if you visit our website, um, we have a whole section that's dedicated to scholarship programs. I just want to quickly navigate to this page so you can see where you can find all the information. So fellowship programs for Pakistani students, graduate students, which includes a Fulbright PhD and masters, undergraduate students, these are the semester and year long exchange programs I was talking about. For working professionals, they list the CCIP, Community College Ex uh, International Program, uh, the Public Administration Program, Journalism, the Fulbright Scholar Program for people that have already cr uh, completed higher graduate level study and they want to go do research, mid-career professionals, Hubert Humphrey, and the, the teachers program. So if you click on any of these sublinks, they'll have all the details, including the requirements, the timeline. Um, in some cases, like in Fulbright's case, you'll actually have a copy of the application available for download as well. Okay? Do you have any other questions about the Fulbright? Yeah. Are there any specific universities which are on the panel of the Fulbright? I mean, you, you send your students to specific universities. Right. Well, there's about 3,900 institutions in the U.S. that are accredited, and we work with an intermediate organization known as the International Institute of Education. So the placements are across the board. In recent years, they've looked at universities that are willing to do cost share. So just to give you a little bit of background, 
Uh, previously, the, the US government and the Pakistan government used to fund these scholarships, and so we used to cover the cost fully through these grants. However, in the last few years, the uh, Pakistan portion of the funding has pretty much gone away. So there's the, the US government grants, and what they're doing is they're working with the institutions to do cost shares. So for instance, if we have a Fulbrighter, and each Fulbright scholarship is worth about a quarter of a million dollars per student, including tuition, living expenses, travel, transportation, everything is covered. Um, so we look for institutions, and I'll give you an example, maybe um, California State University, Fresno, is willing to support a Fulbrighter and cover, um, you know, 50% of that cost. So now we can fund two Fulbrighters instead of giving 250 million to one student. So that's something they do take into consideration, but all the placements are done through the International Institute of Education. And when you apply for the Fulbright, you have the option to list your preferences. So you can do your research, you can identify that for my field, these are the schools that I would love to be placed at. And you list those names. There's no guarantee you'll be placed at those schools, but they take those as your first preference. What's the generally, I mean, the response of the universities which have uh, the best rankings? I mean, there are universities which have the best rankings, either in the US or at a global Pretty level. much. I mean, we've had Fulbrighters across. We, do, we don't focus that much on ranking because ranking varies by field of study. So Harvard might not even be known for its computer science animation program, whereas Caltech is up there. So uh, we tend to not get too caught up in rankings. But just so you know, we have had placements at, you know, just to name a few, Columbia, Columbia um, Berkeley, Princeton, Yale, Duke. Um, it really depends on the, the candidate and the school's interest in the candidate. So there's a lot that kind of goes into play. Sure, we've had a lot of placements in RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design, which is a top fine arts institution, um, Savannah College of Art and Design, and these are just a few off the top of my head, so lots of fine arts placements as well. Yeah. When you make selections for a master's program or PhD, how do you look at the, I mean, the numbers? Like, uh, do you prefer the master's because it is two years program and otherwise it is uh, more than that and you will get more costs on a PhD rather than the, no, I mean typically we have more master's applicants than PhD applicants because there's not as many PhD level qualified applicants out of Pakistan as there are masters. But in terms of the review process, it's not really. Well, I mean, uh, is your preference for PhD scholars? There's no preference. There's no preference. You should apply for whatever you'd like to apply for. Yeah. Uh, I have a more curious question. Uh, as there are always ups and downs in the Pakistan US relations, so is this program in any way affected by the relations? So far, it's still there. It's been around since 1951. Who knows? They're talking about sanctions, putting things in Pakistan, so do you think? This program is at, intact at least for the next couple of years. The way our program structure works, we have been given that guarantee. So if you were to apply this year, you're definitely getting, if you're successful, you'll be getting your quarter of a million grant next year and you'll be going to college, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, does the student have to maintain a certain GPA? Um, to, be, to stay in this college? Uh, Fulbright? doesn't outwardly state any such requirement, but the universities all individually, of course, have their requirements as if you were any other student. So if UC Berkeley has a rule in place that if a student fails three consecutive classes, then they're no longer a full-time student, then that would apply for a Fulbrighter as well. I mean, they don't change the university's policy for the students. But Fulbright doesn't maintain, you know, we don't dictate that, the university dictates those but terms. But bear in mind it's a merit-based scholarship, so I'm sure that maintaining a certain GPA would be, you know, not, not a requirement, but almost... You know, kind of it's like an honor code. <laughs> What's that? 3.5 as a GPA. That's a very good GPA. <laughs> you should be confident in yourself. That's a very good GPA. <laughs> We've had Fulbrighters with less than that, yeah. Yes.
Yeah? Go on. Very good question. So the question is whether the Fulbright is available for degrees such as medicine and law. I'll take the law one first because that's easier. As a Pakistani student, if you've completed the LLB, you can apply for the Fulbright for an LLM. One year master's in the US, yeah? The JD is, it's tricky. Um, you can, you can make your case for it, but we should sit down and talk, as in you should talk to an educational advisor, because you kind of want to weigh the pros and cons of going for a JD after completing your LLB in Pakistan. Because technically in Pakistan, you don't really need. Yeah. And now you want to switch, and you want to take the LSAT, you want to go through the process. What if you're given the LSAT and everything, uh, you just want to check about the full right before? No, it's definitely a possibility. Um, we should talk in further detail though, because I think there's a little bit more of a conversation that needs to happen there. Um, but you are eligible to apply for any field apart from clinical medicine. And there's a reason behind that. I'm gonna do another pop quiz. Um, why do you think that is? Why can't you go on the Fulbright to get an MBBS? You gotta do the US Assembly mm. That that is true. You need the US Assembly for residency in the US, but that's not the reason why. Anybody want to volunteer any answers? That's also very true. Lots of good medical colleges here. So there's Agha Khan, there's Dao, there's Shifa. Huh? Five years, uh, yeah. That's true. I mean, on a very basic level, basically the system of medical schooling in the U.S. is very different from the system of medical schooling in Pakistan. So the two countries are very different. So in Pakistan, like for law and for medicine, you can complete your A levels, your intern, you can go straight into a professional track. In the U.S., you need a foundational four-year bachelor's before you can go to law school or to medical school. But one of the bigger issues is that in the U.S., they're very particular about medical malpractice. So as a US medical student, you don't actually get to interact with a patient some eight to nine years into your study. In Pakistan, <laughs> you can start pretty much as soon as you start your, your study. So there's a lot of medical malpractice issues. And if we were to send Fulbrighters to study medicine, and if there was any malpractice case, then the lawsuits would be something that the entire Fulbright Commission could not afford. So <laughs> that's one of the main reasons it is avoided. However, um, medical profession students should not be discouraged. Every year we have MBBS students that go for relevant fields. So they go for maybe a master's in public health or a master's in public administration with an emphasis on you know, hospital management. So there's a lot of opportunities. It's just any time your degree requires you to interact with students, whether it's for, uh, with patients, whether it's for psychiatry or medicine or anything like that, you cannot apply, you cannot use the Fulbright towards that study. Yes. It won't include that either. The Fulbright would include your neuropsychology. If, like I said, if you're working with patients, I mean, there are fringe fields if you're looking at psychology from a theoretical standpoint or the history of psychology or the, hi there are lots of disciplines even within psychology and psychiatry that do not require you to work in a clinical environment. You're eligible to apply for that. Just as a side note, can everybody hear me in the back? Is this better? Okay. As, a side, <laughs> as a side note, if you want to go to the United States and you want to go for whatever you want to go and it has human interaction, you don't have to apply for the food right there. You can apply as an independent applicant also. Okay, and you can find other opportunities that is, if you need funding, there's always financial aid opportunities. There are also scholarship opportunities that individual universities have. So you don't have to go to the Fulbright to get a full scholarship or get a Fulbright. I mean, there are other universities, but well, again, 3,900 just graduate level universities, 4,300 including undergraduate programs. So if you want to go to the United States, don't let the Fulbright be the only way to go, if you have the means, if you have the finances, independent applicants, I mean, I think that would be the best option. And again, 
And actually, um, Rafia makes a very good point, and I'm kind of hop, this is great, I'm not following any format anymore, I'm just hopping around my slides based on your questions. So um, the way the US timeline works, and I love to kind of share this with students, is that you do need to plan ahead. So if you apply this May for the Fulbright, and suppose you don't get it, okay? And there is a chance, I mean, there's a chance you will get it, but there's also a chance that you won't get it. Suppose you don't get it, it's not the end of the world, okay? And there's still a lot of opportunities, and having applied for the Fulbright, you're better prepared for those opportunities. And the reason for that is, suppose I'm a master's applicant, I apply in May, I take the GRE, I write my uh, graduate statement of purpose, I collect my letters of reference, I get my act together, essentially. And I have to do it because the deadline is May. So I'm forced to get my act together by May, and I apply. Um, you will know, as far as the Fulbright timeline is concerned, you will know probably by July whether you are getting the Fulbright scholarship or not, OK? Um, because interviews will be taking place in June. Um, if you are not a successful Fulbright recipient, and you know that by July, you're in a position to now apply independently because the Fulbright cycle works about six months in advance of the regular cycle. They decide whether you're getting the Fulbright, by July they find out, and then they continue to apply to universities through the regular application cycle, which starts in the fall. So if you don't get the Fulbright, you've already taken the GRE, you can decide whether you want to retake it, you've already written your statement of purpose, you've already done, done some research, maybe you've worked with a, your advisor to identify good schools in your field, and now you can kind of get detailed guidance on how to apply independently. So you can apply independently starting as early as November, October, for business school programs, and they run throughout the year. Deadlines go all the way till February of 2014 for placement in the following fall. Does that timeline make sense? Is it self-explanatory? Okay, so that's, that timeline is one of the reasons I suggest and encourage everyone who is eligible to apply for the Fulbright. If you're hesitating for any reason that, no, I don't feel prepared enough right now, I want to work harder, I want to improve my GRE, um, you're just, you're wasting time. Because except for the cost of the GRE, the Fulbright application is completely free. And if anything else, it'll make you better prepared for when you apply independently. And like Rafia was saying, um, actually we had a US visitor come last year, University of Kentucky, and we were having a similar information session and everyone was asking about the Fulbright, they're asking about the Fulbright, and she got really irritated. She was this really fiery lady. And um, she was like, well, I just wanna ask you all, uh, you know, how many Fulbright scholarships you think there are? And there's about 250 at that time as well. And she shared that the University of Kentucky gives that many full graduate fellowships in any given calendar year. And University of Kentucky is one university that is the size of the entire Fulbright program that we're so proud of, that it's the biggest in the world. University of Kentucky is one university that's already giving about 200 fully funded scholarships, and that's one out of close to 4,000 options in the US. So 4,600 students currently studying in the US, about 3,900 universities in the US, you would think that there would be an average of one Pakistani in every school, but that's not the case. And why is that? It's because everyone waits too long and when they do apply, they apply to Har Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and Yale. So Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and Yale get about 400 applicants every single year. And when students don't get in, they think, Harvard has something against Pakistan. It doesn't. <laughs> OK. So I hope that kind of helps clarify some of the context. And, uh, yeah. The Stoffel also needs to be uh, yes. finalized by 15. No. So the way the Fulbright works, it used to be a requirement, but now only the GRE is required. And if you are shortlisted, if you are getting the Fulbright, at that time they'll make you take the TOEFL because it's a US institution requirement. And it's often also a visa requirement. But they won't make you take the TOEFL up front, so it's just one test. Um, good question, again. Uh, in the cases of some schools, they're willing to issue, and I'm talking beyond the Fulbright. Fulbright, you have to take it. If you're getting the Fulbright, they make you take it. 
okay? Um, some schools, if you're applying independently, and you tell them that, look, my language of instruction was English, I took my ONA levels in English, my bachelor's was in English, all of this was in English, so can you please waive my TOEFL requirement? They will, uh, the school will give you a letter saying it's waived. So you just need to take that in for the visa interview. That's all, it's not an official visa requirement, it just, it helps to kind of prove your case. Um, no. The I-20 is just the university confirming your offer of admission and how much funding and all they're giving you. The visa officer still tries to verify that you would be a competent student on the U.S. campus and so they like to see language proficiency. But you're right, um, if it wasn't for the Fulbright, if you were applying independently, there would probably be a way to waive the TOEFL if you really came down to it. Yeah. Sorry, I think we'll take it. Do you guys help um, high school students applying for um, the undergraduate program? In the yeah, sure. Universities? Oh, if you're applying to the undergraduate program yeah. through USCFP, no. Actually, the reason why we don't help with these undergraduate programs or any of the USCFP sponsored programs is because it becomes a conflict of interest. We are the organization that's giving these scholarships away. We can't be helping you to get into these programs. It's currently merit-based. Which is why, I mean, again, if you are a high school student and you want to apply independently as an applicant, start going to the school well, and finding I just want to clarify, are you applying for a bachelor's degree in the U.S.? Um, yeah, that's true. Okay, yes, so, but that if we you can. Are a, if you were, but this is not for high school students, right? These are all undergraduate exchange programs. So no, you but are enrolled. I think he's saying he wants to study his bachelor's in oh, the U.S. Oh, you want to go to the U.S.? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were going to the... Undergraduate exchange program. Yeah, yeah, of course. We'll let you out. All you have to do is register with us, but we'll show you how to register at the end of the presentation. Um, if you register, listen, we help you out with basically this timeline. We'll help guide you in finding the right school that's best for you. You'll find, you'll choose the school yourself, but we'll show you how to do that based on your area of uh, interest, what you want to study, whether you want to go to a public university, private, urban, rural campus whether you know you want to go study engineering but you also want to do a minor in like musical history or something of the sort. If you'll find the school that's best fit for you, we'll have, um, we have you know SAT or ACT prep, um, I mean we have all these books and resources in our office library. Now you have a really great resource of using the e-library uh, if shining up. And uh, so you can access all these books. You can get a you know a bunch of friends together and study for the SAT or the ACT. We even conduct free mock um, SAT or ACT tests for you under real time conditions. I'll give you the score right then. Um, then when it comes time to starting to write the essay, like your student essay, we'll help you out with that. Again, this is only for independent applicants. Okay, so we'll help critique it. You write it. I'll tell you what works, what doesn't work. So basically, we'll taking you through the timeline. So as an undergraduate applicant right now, if you're graduating in May, what, okay, yes, if you're graduating in May, then you would have already, you're probably in your first year right now, A-level first year, right? And the student applying for the sports scholarship, are you also in your A-level first year? Oh, you're in your second, so you're a little bit late according to this timeline, but that's okay. Um, now is the time, A1 is the ideal time, this summer you should be taking all your standardized tests, SAT or ACT like Grafia said, and then you'll be applying this fall. So very quickly, since we are talking about this, I've talked about, you know, signing up with an educational advisor. So on our website again, if you go under educational, you'll see that there's a link here, and it's still loading. There's a link on this page that says register with an educational advisor. You can register as a student, as an alumni, there's a lot of categories, but you'd be registering as a student. Um, and while this page is, okay, um, well, I don't know why that's working. Do we have any more, I see a lot of young faces in the crowd also, so if anybody wants to ask any questions about undergraduate programs, yes. Okay, go for it. Look, if you don't have the information to fill in, like if they're asking for a publication and you don't have a publication that's published, you don't have to fill it in. Yeah. It's 
honestly, it's just a very exhausting application only because there are so many different fields of study that are going to be applying for the Fulbright. So if that doesn't apply to you, that's okay. Yeah, you don't have to fit in every single line. If you don't have a publication, don't lie about it. <laughs> yes. Um, what kind of fully funded scholarships, the opportunities that are uh, that's a good question. What kind of opportunities? I mean, again, most of them are going to be non meat based It's going to be merit-based financial, well, sorry, not financial, but scholarship opportunities. Um, once you know the schools you want to go to, say you want to go to Mount Holyoke, you want to go to Smith College, you want to go to whatever else college you want to, and you have these universities um, or you have these colleges selected, that you're sure that these are the schools you want to apply to, then you start asking or you go to their individual websites and find out more about the kind of scholarships that are available. If they're fully funded, look, it's difficult to get a fully funded opportunity for anybody, even if you're a really, really smart student. I don't know if they have a quota as such, but if you are, um, if they do you know, see that you're a valid candidate, they might take you in or you might have to write an extra essay for something like that. There might be a $5,000 scholarship just if you, you know, if you write an extra essay and you compete for that prize. So that's, a lot of these opportunities are for international students especially. Because but ba basically at the undergraduate level, so like the Fulbright is an external scholarship program. So for undergraduate applicants, students that want to study their bachelors in the US, we don't have an external scholarship program but the institutions offer funding directly. So like when I went to the University of uh, Pennsylvania, I got a financial aid package from the school. When Rafia went to Ohio Wesleyan, she got a financial aid package from the school. And if the internet were working, I would show you one of the tools we really rely on for undergraduate um, uh, uh, programs. So basically, like I said before, there's about 3,900 universities it can be a daunting task to kind of try and narrow down, okay, out of these programs, which ones do I have the best chances of getting a full scholarship at? So what we utilize and we tell our students to utilize is this College Board website because they have a really fantastic search engine that they've improved in the last year. And for graduate applicants, suppose you're, even if you're applying for the Fulbright or you're applying independently, there's a comparable search engine called petersons.com. So College Board .org for undergraduate applicants, petersons.com for graduate applicants. They both have a good search engine and this is what the website looks like when you first get to it and right up top there's a button that you can see. This is also the website you use to register for the SAT. So you might be familiar with it already. You can create a free account with them, you can look at upcoming test dates, things like that. But they've added this tool, uh, which is a college search engine. I've just clicked on this button, it's gonna take a minute to load. But I'll run you through this tutorial, especially for parents, I think it's really helpful because you can kind of do this search alongside with your, with your son or daughter and you can kind of see what opportunities are there. So I think this is gonna take a minute to load. While this is loading, can I take any other questions? Included in the Fulbright, if you uh, would like to apply for a master's in a related field, you have a background in writing, creative writing, you're welcome to apply. Yeah? Um, is this to be stuck with just one university or can the credits be transferred to another one? On the Fulbright? On the Fulbright, you have to stay with the university that you're placed in because you go into an agreement if the university is doing cost shares and they put a lot of thought into why they're placing you where they're placing you. So once that placement has been made, students are not transferred. So sports scholarship coming to an undergrad, again, if... Master's level sports scholarships are not exactly done through the Fulbright. Um, if you're applying independently, again, anytime you're talking about sports scholarships, I just want to give you a little bit of insight. There is money in sports scholarships in the US, but the reason why there's money in sports scholarships is that these teams, institutions in the US that are really prize themselves over their sports, whether it's, you know, basketball or whatever it is that they're offering, they're trying to build up their competency as a national league or with competing with other schools. So if they're giving you a big scholarship to bring you on board, 
They basically want you to come and work for their team. That's why they're investing in you. So the concept of transfers, once again, when it comes to sports scholarships, becomes a little bit iffy. Because if the coach really likes you and they're giving a scholarship for you to come and join the team, why would they want to give you up to some other school? They usually have you sign a contract for their varsity team. And we can apply for any under Fulbright, yes. Any degree except clinical medicine. Oh, clinical. Um, yes, only after. Sports scholarship, whatever sport, yes, you're looking for. Uh, the, um, I don't your, yes, you, you, whatever academic field you're taking, as long as you're doing the sports alongside. Yes, yes. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Regarding the graduate program, what if you have an admission from a university where you've applied as an independent candidate? But, and you have like seven offers, but those universities are not willing to fund you. And you also have not been given the full price, so where do you go to them? Good question. Okay. So looking at the timeline, if this May you have this problem, it means that you applied last fall, as in anywhere between October to February, most recently, and you got an acceptance offer from some place. Now, that's fine. If you're applying for the Fulbright this year, though, you need to realize that this will be for placement in 2014. So even if you're holding an acceptance offer in hand from the last application cycle, that'll be for this fall. So you need to contact those universities. The first thing you need to do is tell them, look, I didn't get scholarship with you. I'm glad I got accepted. I want to defer my enrollment to the following academic calendar, which puts you in the 2014 running, right? Then you apply for the Fulbright. Suppose Fulbright works out, they will definitely take into consideration where you've already been admitted because it shows your competency as a student as well, right? So your chances of getting the Fulbright may be improved by that. <laughs> but there's no guarantee that if they're giving you that full scholarship, they'll want to place you back at that institution. I mean, it shouldn't matter to you because if you're getting a full scholarship, you're getting a full scholarship, right? What do you want to go in like this term? What do you want to go in two, three? They can't. They can't interfere with the Fulbright cycle. Also, even if you were to look for, even if you were to look for financial aid, you're past the financial aid de priority deadline, which is March 15th. So, if you want to go this fall, I would either say defer your admissions for next year or look for alternate financing. And by alternate financing, you mean? An uncle. <laughs> a rich uncle. No, I don't know. I mean, really, really. Your best. Give a brief um, uh, first insight job. into like the university jobs on the campus. Sure. So once again, not to be confused with Fulbright, but if you're applying, because if you're going through Fulbright, you really don't have any need to work at all. You have a surplus of money, honestly. Also, you won't be allowed to work. Yes. <laughs> if you're applying independently, um, the university gives you financial aid, whether you're a bachelor student or a master student, in the form of fellowships or TA ships. So every student uh, may be eligible for something called work study. So again, legally, they're very particular about the in the U.S. about the number of hours that a student can work because they're also expecting the student to complete full-time study. So they don't allow the student to take on a full-time job because they think that the load then becomes too much and the student might suffer. So um, they usually cap it at about 20 hours per week at most. And uh, for graduate students, oftentimes, the financial aid can be in the form of fellowships or TA ships where you're helping a professor or you're helping with a class. And for undergraduate students, it can be anything from helping out in the library to, again, working on different projects on campus. So there are opportunities to work. Um, but it should be within the federal work study. It shouldn't be something beyond that because that's technically illegal. Somebody's got a master's degree in computer science from a U.S. Uh, university. Is it possible for him or her to apply in a different subject for a master's degree in there? Yes, but again, uh, and the question was, if you have a master's in a certain field, can you apply through the Fulbright for a master's in another field? Are you going to apply through the Fulbright or independent? Uh, through Fulbright? Yeah, 
you can but again uh, you just need to keep in mind like any other university or scholarship granting organization they're going to be making a decision on you so if it seems like too much of a jump and you can't convince them as to why you want to do this or what is your reasoning behind it it'll work against you Right. Yes, definitely, definitely. In so fact, you have related work experience in that new yeah, I mean, most people apply for fields that are not directly related. There may be some overlap, but not directly related to their. Just a quick reminder. I hope everybody realizes that when you go to the Fulbright, say you go for the master's program, it's a two-year program. You need to return to Pakistan for two years. You can't just find a job in the United States and start working have to return to Pakistan for those two years. The kind of the, the understanding between, mutual understanding between the two governments is that when you learn, or what you learn in the United States, you have to return to Pakistan and apply what you've learned. What, you learn. what about the program that is master's needed to PhD? We don't, through the Fulbright, that isn't offered anymore. So you're either applying for a master's or you're applying for a PhD. PhD also you have to Yes. If you spend five years in the United States, you need to return to Pakistan for five years. Okay? And then you can feel free to apply. You had a question? If you are in the competitive uh, analysis between the people who are applying, if somebody has graduated and has worked as uh, relevant to work experience, does it count for them getting a better opportunity of things like You see, the uh, Fulbright evaluation is holistic so they'll be looking at everything side by side work experience is not a formal requirement except for MBA applicants so if you're applying for an MBA through the Fulbright you do need three years of work experience um, for any other field it's not a requirement however um, you will see students that have work experience are able to maybe justify their need for a master's better they're able to talk about real life experiences in the workplace so they sometimes have a little bit more context but it's not a requirement i mean a lot of students go straight from lums iba they go straight so it's not needed What's that? Transfer from the local school to the US. Uh, as a bachelor student? And you want to transfer to the US. Okay, so transfer admission is a possibility. Uh, we don't usually recommend it though. And the reason for that is uh, if a student's completed two years of a bachelor here, there's no guarantee that the US school will give you a full two years of credit. Okay, now it's up to the student if, if the student has to, you know, if the circumstances are such that they really have to go to the US and they really have to transfer, then the student needs to be really proactive. They should work with us and try and identify the schools first. And then they're going to need to talk to the registrar, try and get some confirmation beforehand in terms of what credit hours can be transferred. Because uh, transfer admission is tricky. Um, transfer students do not get priority for financial aid, so it's very hard to get funding. And secondly, um, like I was saying, the chances are low that you'll get full two years transferred. So you might end up spending five years or six years completing a bachelor's degree when it only should have taken you four years, not more. Yeah. Okay, and I think we're, it's four o'clock, so we're out of time, but what I did want to share, and unfortunately um, the internet is still a little bit slow, so the search engine is not opening, but I would encourage all of you to, if you're applying for your bachelor's, go visit collegeboard.org, and if you're applying for your master's, go visit petersons.com, um, because they have a really great search engine. And I wanted to show this to um, the lady and her daughter here that were asking about scholarships. You can basically type in, it starts with all 3,900 and you can type in, I'm looking for a full scholarship in California and the average GPA is 2.0. And it'll show you results for that. It'll give you a list of names. So do that. And what I also want to share is our contact information right here. Um, you can call our general number, 8431300, and ask for the advising department. Um, our office hours are 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. 
And we also have, for any of you applying for the Fulbright, we have GRE prep resources, we have books, we have prep classes that are starting on the 25th. So all of that information, you can call us, you can register, you can also visit our Facebook page online. Um, by the, before you guys leave, I do recommend you guys pick up one of these brochures from up front. Um, it's a pretty good brochure in the sense it talks about the programs, including the Fulbright, it talks about advising services, what you can gain out of registering with us. Again, all our, all our advising services are free. The only thing you have to pay for is once you have to start taking the test, so the SAT or the ACT, etc. okay? And here's a list of what the program and testing center has, so all the services that we offer in this and all our contact information as well. And if you really think that you need like something really, really Thank you.